Okay, we're back. We're live. We're Think Tech Talks here in Honolulu, broadcasting from the lower level of Pioneer Plaza at the core of downtown Honolulu, where everybody lives, works, plays, and learns. And learns is the, is the stress this time. Uh, we're visiting with people today. We're visiting with Larry Jordan, uh, a video software educator, if I may, at LarryJordan.biz. Welcome to the show, Larry. Uh, Jay, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you here. In a way of uh, you know my own uh, observations and uh, introductions, uh, I, I met Larry. Uh, uh, he doesn't know this. <laughs> <laughs> quite some time ago, uh, taking uh, taking software courses from him at lynda.com, mostly in Final Cut Pro, Final Cut Pro 6 and 7, I guess it was, years ago. And, and uh, you know, we're a video video editing and studio kind of affair, a non-profit, Larry. And um, I think, in large part, you made it all start for us. You made it possible for us to generate the videos that got us started uh, by showing me how to do Final Cut Pro. So today, after all these years, it's great to have you on the Skype. It's great to have you on the show. That's um, my pleasure, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you turned your career into something useful. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> you, you, you know about my, my past as a lawyer then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I use the word useful. I heard that. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I looked at your uh, site, your blog, uh, and I'm, you know, every time I look, I'm more impressed. In the old days, if I can take you back to lynda.com, you were probably the most influential guy in video software there. And, uh, you know, I really like the way lynda.com works, and certainly you've taken a page out of their book. Um, because you have an outline of, of subtopics, and you can address a uh, you know a subject, uh, some software, either either uh, on, a, on a linear basis, going down through the outline, sort of as a course, or you can use it as a reference, looking at any one uh, particular element that you need to know about. So it's a, that kind of approach um, not only teaches you, but lets you go back and learn what you missed. And I suspect that uh, when you left Lynda.com, which has to be about what, three years ago or something like that. Yes, yeah, about five years ago. Oh, oh gee whiz, how fast time moves, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you started uh, LarryJordan.biz, and uh, now you've really taken it off. You've gone, you've gone into the heavens with uh, a very expert-focused kind of approach uh, on, on uh, is, it, is it only Final Cut Pro? or You also do uh, Premiere, right? I do indeed. Actually, LarryJordan.biz was the website I started 11 years ago. And Linda came to me about two or three years after I'd started my company, asking if I was interested in doing some training for them. And I said yes, because at that point I was really doing consulting and system installation and, and hadn't done any online training at all. So I worked with Linda for, for two or three years, specifically revolving around the Final Cut 5, Final Cut 6 uh, suite of products. At the same time, uh, through Linda, I got connected with Peach Pit Press and started to write my first of what's now become eight books, uh, five on Final Cut and three on Adobe Premiere. And then when uh, Linda and I split the uh, amicably, but uh, I'm doing uh, other stuff now, I realized that there was a market for training, and what we principally focused on then was uh, seminars, traveling around the country doing face-to-face -face seminars. Mm -hmm which worked well until the economy melted down about five years ago and then nobody could afford to go to seminars. So looking around, I realized that, that uh, the Internet was finally able to support video to the level that we would need to do to do online training. So I've been writing articles and technical articles on my website for the last 12 years. Our website now has got over a thousand technical articles covering every version of Final Cut and most versions of Premiere and and all the related software from DVD Studio Pro and Soundtrack in the past to Motion and Compressor Today to Prelude and Adobe Media Encoder because I realized that, that for some people, video is just something they're dabbling in, and virtually any application will work. But if you have to make a career out of doing video, all of a sudden the questions become overwhelming because they affect your ability to meet deadlines and your ability to deliver to the client specs, and video is enormously complex. So I was able to take my background as a, as a television producer director and pour that into my knowledge of computers and software and turn that into an in-depth resource specifically focused on audio and video applications. And the site has taken off since then. And from that, we've got online training. We've got more books. We've got technical articles. Yeah, I want to break and, that down. But, but you're, um, 
you're, you're uh, actually appealing to all, all people, everyone who does video software, right? I mean, it, it's the professionals, it's the amateurs, it's everyone. That's absolutely correct. The way I like to think of it is I help the professionals keep work, and I help the amateurs understand their hobby and be more successful with it. Oh, oh you ready for a quiz? You sitting down? <laughs> okay, so here's the question. The question is, what's the difference between a professional and a hobbyist? Okay. The theme from Jeopardy is now playing. Go ahead, take a guess. <laughs> uh, 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 one makes a living at it. <laughs> Yep, the professional expects to get paid. Now, cast your mind back to when you were working for a living. When would you actually get paid for anything? You got paid when you finished. Yes. With a hobbyist, the hobbyist is in love with the process. Yes. They love the idea of editing video, and if it gets done this week or next month or next year, they're having so much fun playing and telling stories. And I mean, if it never gets done, they're still happy because for them, the process is everything. You for mean, a professional, a professional doesn't have that benefit. No, the professional does, but the professional's got the professional has got to eat, and if the professional doesn't deliver their job on time, on budget, to the client's specifications, they don't get paid. Mm -hmm. At which point they've shifted out of being a professional back into a hobbyist. A professional, by definition, has to get paid for the work, which means they've got to finish. Which means if you're up to your eyebrows and alligators and surrounded by questions and you don't know where to go for reliable answers, well, that's where a site like mine can help. Yes, got to have immediate answers, got to have answers that understand, you know, the inquiry and give you a, a fast way to get back to work. Uh, but and that, you, need it, you need it when you need it. If it's 2 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning, you need it then. You don't want to wait for something to, to, for the office to reopen the next day. <laughs> but you're, you're suggesting this kind of psychic benefit for everyone, and I, and I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, I, my life is on hold when I'm editing video. Everything stops. I can't think of anything else in the world, and I get tremendous gratification out of seeing it go on the screen. I'm not sure it's any good yet, but, but I get, and that's <laughs> it's the only thing that counts is, is my gratification. I'm thinking, and you would be a good focal point on this, that I'm not the only one who's in this spot, and that there's no. pr probably millions of people out there who are having the same experience right now. Uh, you are absolutely correct. Uh, one of the things I've discovered over the last two years is no one reads anymore. But my <laughs> book sales alone prove that. But what they do do is they are communicating with pictures and communicating with video, whether it's something simple on Facebook or a viral video that suddenly lit the, the skies on YouTube or they're delivering it with broadcast television. Pictures are everything today. Which means if, if I want to be a successful leader of any industry or a leader in a company or a thought leader, I have to be able to communicate with pictures. Now, how do we communicate with pictures? Well, that leads into everything that we're doing from still images in Photoshop or, or Adobe Illustrator into video, whether it's shot on a cell phone or the, the most expensive Sony or Airy camera you get your hands on. The process is still how do we tell a compelling story? that people I, want to watch I have a quote and for get you. it done on deadline. I have a quote for you that you can use in your materials. Video is the new literature. Yeah. Um, see, the problem with literature is it assumes uh, an intellect. Uh, I, think, I think a better way to say it is, is, is no one reads. They want to be shown. They want to watch. They want to see. Yeah. And, and for, well, look at this. Why is your podcast video? I mean, the, um, it's wonderful. I wore a clean shirt just for you, but the picture's Thank irrelevant. You, the, the, and what you look, you, I mean, you look stunning, by the way. I think that, that hairstyle of yours becomes you. But It's very easy, no, my hairstyle. Nobody cares, nobody cares what we look like, except if you did this as an audio-only podcast, your audience would be a fraction of the size that it is, yeah. simply because people want to be able to see, and the audio comes along for the ride, whereas... If you were to cut the audio out, there'd be no content. Yeah. But if you cut the video, people would say, ah, it's just audio. There's no interest here. Yeah. It's a very interesting psychological place we found ourselves where we have to have pictures for people to pay attention. I agree. So, you know, one thing, even, even amateurs, uh, even people who just try at this sort of thing, uh, they are always trying to make it better. I know we are. Every day there has to be a material improvement in everything we do. And therefore we have to learn. And you know, the body of knowledge out there will help us do this is very important. And the, the ultimate level of quality that we get, and I suppose the whole, the whole group gets, 
is always going up. Uh, you must see that also. Those millions of people who are interested in this, who are committed to it, they must be getting better and better and better. Is it true? Well, some people are happy just to get it done. And that's been true of every task. It's just, man, I made it through. I didn't think I would live through it. It's done. It's finished. But those people that really are hooked, that really want to improve their craft, are always challenging themselves to make it better, to make it more focused, or to improve the quality of the audio or the image. I mean, look at the microphone that you're using right now. You, you've you changed mics a couple times as you're trying to figure out, how do I get the best sound? And sure. what size crew do I need behind me to be able to pull this thing off and sure. have it run smoothly? Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly the situation of, of anybody that's interested in improving the quality of their work in any profession. It's just that we are working where other people can see the results of our work. And you have, you have the ability to help me uh, reach the next level. You have the ability to take me to uh, places that I haven't been before. And that means that you have got to be at the front end. You've got to be pushing the envelope all the time with the books and the webinars and uh, you know, all the things you do in your blog on the website and so forth. Uh, I don't know. How we, do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as I would like. It's a, it's a really interesting puzzle. There's, I, I was reminded back when I was a producer director and doing live television, which is like this. You can't, there's nothing more fun than live. And I was doing live television, and one of the directors that I was working with on a different show walked into the office and slammed his notebook down on his desk. He turned to me and says, when do I stop learning and start doing? And I've thought for the last 40 years, I can't think of a time where we've had the ability to stop learning and just start doing. Every day is different. And you're absolutely right. I am driven to, to, to figure out the latest version of the software. At the same time, it's psychologically inside, I'd, I say, you know, it'd be really nice if I could just take a week off and not do anything. Just, you know, take a week off, and, but I can't. There's, there's articles I've got to write. There's, there's vendors I've got to talk to. There's new software I have to learn. And for me, there's this balance between I really, really want to know everything, and I want to share it with you because it's only when I share that anybody else can learn versus I'd really like to take a nap. And so far, so far the nap is not winning. <laughs> Well, you're getting gratification, too, you know, to, to the extent that you know I'm getting gratification and focusing on my, my time on trying to do a better job. You know, you're helping me, and uh, I appreciate it, but also you're, you're having sort of derivative, derivative gratification out of that, and times that by, you know, however many thousands or hundreds of thousands of followers you have, that, that, that would keep you up at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the thing that, that uh, the, the one that's really hard, it's always wonderful to get thank you notes. And, and I'm very grateful that, that people like yourself like the work that I do. That's just a huge, huge plus for me. But the ones that I really worry over is, is it's the guy that writes at 2 o'clock in the morning says, I'm facing a deadline at 7 o'clock. The whole system is down. There's nobody to turn to. Help me. Uh, you know, your heart goes out to those people, and, and I do the very best I can to give them a hand. And I'd say 80 to 85 percent of the time, I can fix their problem with that's with an email. That's pretty good. But it is it. Uh, I know those deadlines, and I know what it's like to feel the footsteps walking up your back and say, "I'm here alone in a dark room with technology that's letting me down, and I don't know how to fix it. Where do I go for help?" That really is is why I put my whole website together. Yeah. And your web, I can go on your website and look at stuff, right? You're doing this as a, as a favor to the world in large part, well, there's, am I right? There's, there, yeah, the, there's, um, everything on the website is free. There's a big asterisk there. Everything that I write, of which there are hundreds and thousands of articles, everything I write is free, always has been fully searchable on Google. We get, I don't know, 50,000 hits a day. Then that video training, that which has got pictures, I sell because my wife and, and employees insist on being paid and fed for reasons that I have not yet been able to convince them <laughs> otherwise. So I've got to generate revenue to keep the business going. So all of my video training, whether it's based on subscriptions or the stuff you download, all of that is paid for. So you buy that. And the nice thing is, is that it's really, really carefully developed instruction so that you can take it either in, in real small doses of five to ten minutes of video or yeah. 
I do these weekly webinars like your show here. It's an hour on an in-depth look at a specific subject. For instance, last week we were looking at third-party plugins for Final Cut 10. We've looked at how to do video compression with Adobe Media Encoder, how to pre-log and screen video with Adobe Prelude, and then just countless sessions on media management with Final Cut 10 because it's in in the nuts and bolts, how do I get it from point A to point B? Not in the effects. People will spend their life looking for effects, but they won't spend a, a minute looking for media management until they're suddenly lost and the software isn't working and they can't figure out how to fix it. Isn't that so true? A lot, a lot of what I do is focus on, guys, here's how you get started, here's how you prevent problems, here's how you troubleshoot your system. That's, that's what I do. Back to basics and understanding the basics. That's Larry Jordan, a video software educator par excellence. Uh, and this is Think Tech Talks, and we're having a visit with him, and we're going to take a short break and be right back. Castle and Cook, Hawaii. Investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Collateral Analytics, empowering the real estate industry to make better informed property investment decisions. The Foreign Trade Zone, bringing the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone programs to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. Galen Ho, a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. Hawaiian Electric Company, and its affiliates Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, incorporating diverse perspectives to design a flexible and forward-looking energy strategy. Hawaii Energy, the state's energy and efficiency program created to help Hawaii's residents and businesses adopt a clean energy lifestyle. Hawaii Gas, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Hawaii Pacific Health, bringing technology and teamwork together to transform healthcare in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, attached to DBED, is the state's leading technology agency. The Scheidler Family Foundation, supporting educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. Okay, we're Easy. back. We're live. We're doing Think Tech Talks in a visit with Larry Jordan, a video software educator uh, par excellence at LarryJordan.biz. And um, you know, before the break, we were talking about exactly what the what the, you know what the universe is like in terms of educating uh, you know a, a lot of people who need to know about video software. But now I'd like to focus on one article I saw on your blog, uh, and that is the new, uh, not yet quite out. Uh, Mac Pro, that screaming fast machine that's perfectly round, like it came from space. Uh, what do you think <laughs> of it, Larry? I tell you, when I unboxed it for the very first time and I pulled it out, and you look at this 8-inch high piece of solid black aluminum, I felt like I was looking at something from another world. You look at the finish and it just captures your eye and you can't look away from it. And you take the cover off and you look at the circuit boards, even the circuit boards are black. It's a piece of art from inside out that is phenomenally fast. I'm just, it was it's just, it's the sort of thing where you'd put it on the desk and you'd want people to come over and look at it and you'd disconnect all the wires so they could look at the inside. It's, it's just, I was left speechless. And it's a beautiful piece of gear. I had a chance for about, oh, four weeks to work with the 12-core version, which is the high-end version. An $18,000 model. <laughs> the, yeah, it was, I think it was the $8,000 models. One step okay. down from okay. the absolute top. Okay. And uh, I had, uh, what was interesting is, is, is a very interesting equation that we're in right at this very moment. And that is that we are making the transition from spinning media to flash media. Mm -hmm. So it's all flash inside, which is which is incredibly fast, but doesn't hold a lot of data. A standard hard disk will hold far more than flash will, but it's really fast. And one of the things I wanted to find out is just where does that speed make a difference? And And the thing that I think is most exciting about the Mac Pro is not where it is right now but where it will be in about four to five months because all the software that runs on it needs to be optimized to run on the new dual CP, the dual GPUs, the graphics processing units inside. The way the Mac Pro has been designed is it has two GPUs mm -hmm. and these are like rocket assisted booster thingies that one, one is dedicated solely to driving monitors 
Mm -hmm. And the other is dedicated solely to helping the CPU. It's like putting a jet assist on a, on a Volkswagen bug. This Volkswagen is going to just take off and scream. Yeah. But software has to be written to take advantage of it. So a lot of the tests that were going on when the Mac Pro first shipped were showing that the Mac Pro wasn't a whole lot faster for a lot of activities because none of the software had been written for dual GPUs because th they were such a small subset of the market that no developer could really spend their time writing software to support something which existed in maybe one quarter of one percent of the marketplace. Now it's soon going to be five and ten percent and clearly the dual GPU idea is going to catch on both in the Mac and Windows for additional uh, computers than just the Mac Pro. It now gives us serious hardware acceleration and the reason this is so important is that audio and video and and pictures, Photoshop, are all bitmap based. Well audio was well We'll pretend. But they're bitmap based, which makes them really ideal for working with GPUs, as opposed to uh, printing or mathematical calculations, which would work better maybe with a CPU. Mm -hmm. But video just loves all that C GPU power. Yeah. So, and, but does and this so mean that seeing... the software has not yet been written? I mean, I, I know it hasn't come out yet, so that it, it, it is, nobody really actually really needs it except a test person like your own self. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. You're, you're. That's not a true statement. The Mac Pro has been shipping since the last week of December. Okay. There are they. They cannot keep up with the demand. The demand is so high. It's being manufactured out of a plant in Texas, okay. and the delivery times right now are stretching out to about six weeks. But they have. They have, in fact, been shipping since uh, the end of December. So it is, it is a shipping product. It's got a huge demand. It's incredibly sexy. It's very, very fast. But not all software has yet been optimized for it. As that software continues to, to improve and, and to be optimized, we're going to see significant improvements in performance on key software, the way that we do now with Premiere Pro and Final Cut 10 have both been optimized to take advantage of the dual GPUs that the Mac Pro provides. Okay, so if I went out and got one, and it takes six weeks, but if I went out and got one and I had the new, the newest Final Cut 10, what is it, 10.1? 10.1.1. .1. Um, .1. Okay, 10.1.1, then I would get that screaming maximum speed right, right now, today, I mean, as soon as I got it in the office. You would, but the question is, more importantly, what are you editing? For instance, a lot of us have, for years, obsessed about, oh, I'm going to get... I'm going to get a 2.4 gigahertz CPU. Maybe, no, 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 maybe I should get a, a 2.55 gigahertz CPU. <laughs> well, what does the CPU speed do for you? We can edit video, standard high definition, definition video, 720p, 1080p. We can edit video right now today on a Mac Mini. A Mac Mini can edit video. We could do 2K video on any Mac that's been shipping for the last three years. We can do 4K video on any Mac that's been shipping in the last two years. Mm. So the, the problem is the CPU is no longer the bottleneck. We obsess about the computer because it's a lot of money, mm -hmm. because it has a lot of capability. But in terms of video editing, any computer today shipping can edit 2K, 4K video without any problem. Now. The challenge becomes not in the video, but in rendering effects. Now, if you start to get into effects, now we have to start looking at more horsepower because the faster your computer system overall runs, the faster the renders will occur. So what we're seeing is a growing level of impatience. I remember before you were born, I was doing some video editing at Adobe Premiere, I think it was four, and I applied a Gaussian blur to a clip. It was standard definition DV clip. It took 30 seconds, three zero seconds, for that one frame to render with a Gaussian blur wow. because the computers were so slow back then. Yeah. But compared to doing it by hand, I couldn't blur it any other way. I thought, wow, 30 seconds, how can it get better than this? And now we're expecting it to be real time with no rendering. So the challenge for us now is getting GPUs, graphics char cards, that are fast enough. That's a biggie, but the even biggier biggie is you need to get a storage system that's fast enough to support it. I mean, look at your setup with you, with the videos that you do. Your video devours storage. You're always adding more hard disk space, and Absolutely it needs to be true. faster. And you're going to spend far more with buying hard disks and high-speed storage than you will ever spend on your computer, and yet you're going to spend more time agonizing over the computer you're about to buy than trying to come up with a coherent plan of how much do I spend to get storage that's going to last me for the next year.
Right. If you did the other, you'd you'd spend you'd get a little bit more money up front to get the storage that you need, and then your computers would act like they had rocket assists with them. Right. I'm mean, right right now. I mean, this week I have this problem where it keeps coming. This is now Adobe, but it keeps coming up with a message that says you're uh, you're out of space on your on your uh, primary drive. Go yep. go go delete something. So I have to go chase and figure out what to delete. I know there's <laughs> got to be a better solution than spending an hour deleting before I can go to the next step of my editing. Yeah, it's called buying a larger hard disk, and it's exactly, I mean, there's two states for a hard disk. They're either empty or full. There's nothing in between. <laughs> true. You buy it, it's empty. You leave it on your desk overnight, and without doing anything, it's 85% full. It just fills up overnight magically. <laughs> Well, you know, this is this is really amazing. But let me let me. So right now, this is Adobe uh, Premiere Six, uh, Premiere Pro. Um, I, I make a movie every week, twenty eight minutes and thirty seconds, and um, it takes me roughly one hour and fifteen minutes to render that on Adobe, and and you know create the MOV. Um, I'm just wondering uh, what's going to happen when I get my new Mac Pro. How much faster is that going to be? Is it going to cut it into ten minutes or what? It depends upon what video format you're editing, and it depends upon the kind of effects that you're creating. So, what video format are you shooting? Well, let's see. Uh, you mean size? No, it's in codec. The image size is irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant. There's, there's three things that we don't care about. We don't care about frame rate, not for the purposes of rendering. Mm -hmm. We really don't particularly care about image size. It's relevant if you get to 2K and 4K, but not 720 or 1080. And we don't really care about interlaced versus progressive. By the way, tell everyone in your audience they need to shoot progressive. Interlaced is a disaster on the web. It's great for broadcast, it's disaster on the web. But we don't care about that either. All we care about is what's called the codec. The, is it AVC HD? Is it AVC CAM? Is it uh, XAVC? Is it ProRes? Is it uh, H.264? Is it DV? Is it HDV? A you HDV. Tell what the codec is. HDV? Yeah. It's out of a Sony. Sony has at least 15 different codecs. I know, and this is a Z5U, so the, the, the HDV okay, is HD. native to that camera. HDV is an MPEG-2 format. MPEG-2 is an older standard. It's been around for 10, 15 years, the, but really in popular use for the last seven or eight. Mm -hmm. The big problem with HDV is that it tends not to be as reliable as AVC HD. It tends to have time code problems. It tends to have breakup problems, and it, it's compressed in what's called a long GOP format. Long GOP means that pictures are not compressed individually, pictures are compressed as a group. Mm -hmm. uh, this has ramifications in terms of playback speed, especially on multicam editing, and it also has ramifications when you're outputting. So HDV is not a friendly format. If you were to take that HDV format and convert it into something which is more editing friendly, whether that's ProRes 422 or Avid's uh, DNX HD mm -hmm. or Cineform from GoPro, these are much faster formats that, that edit and will output faster just by converting the format into something that will output quicker. You should be able to cut your render times, your output times in half. That's just by changing the format. Then, if you when add, when do you do that? Pro, When's your opportunity to actually do that before uh, you start editing on the run, the run clips? through? Well, with uh, you could run it through compressor or with the C the, the Creative Cloud version, not the CS6 version, but the Creative Cloud version of Adobe Media Encoder. Adobe Media Encoder can convert it from the HDV into ProRes 422. Uh, the CS6 has got a couple problems in doing that conversion. If you're working with CS6, you'd be better off working with Apple Compressor or MPEG Stream Clip to do the conversion. Ideally, you'd want to deinterlace it. Ideally, you want to convert it to ProRes 422. And then just those two changes alone would probably cut in half the amount of time you're spending with rendering and output. Then when you add the power of the Mac Pro on top of that, it should easily be, uh, what computer are you running on now, a Mac Pro or an iMac? A Mac Pro. Yeah, it should probably be, without knowing much more about it, you should be able to be double the speed. So double the speed of your Mac Pro and double the speed with uh, the format con conversion, your hour and 15 minutes should go down to probably five to seven minutes. Oh, oh and you know what? We have this on tape. Uh, what you just said... <laughs> 
I'm gonna, I may go back and look at it several times, then maybe go to your website and learn a little about that conversion. That's Larry Jordan, video software educator, and you have seen him <laughs> in full regalia. Uh, check out LarryJordan.biz. This is Think Tech Talks, uh, visiting with people, and today we're visiting with Larry Foreman, uh, Jordan. We'll be right back after this break. Hold, hold still, Larry. We'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Bye. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live here at Think Tech Talks, visiting with Larry Jordan, getting some advice and consultation, I might add. <laughs> 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 Larry Jordan, a video software educator, um, par excellence. So I wanted to I wanted to cover in this uh, part of the show, Larry. Um, you know the great the great battle about uh, Final Cut Pro, and it went from seven to ten, and everybody complained. And it was this scathing article in the New York Times. It must be what two or three years ago now. Uh, just lambasting them for actually withdrawing some of the functionality they, they had had before. And the, and the, and the pros, the professionals, uh, were really ticked off at them about that. And I think they lost a lot of business at, at it. And uh, uh, everybody, everybody was saying that Apple really didn't care about its base of editors anymore, and they were abandoning, uh, you know, their, their devoted friends over all the years of video editing. What, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a number of things happened at the same time. I've, I've told uh, before, and, and, and we'll be glad to tell it again, and I've shared this with Apple, that, that Apple totally blew the launch of Final Cut 10. They had the ability to have Final Cut 7 and Final Cut 10 run in parallel for a year while people would make the transition from one to the other, and for whatever reason, uh, they chose not to do that. And they had the ability to, to make a very smooth transition from Final Cut 7 to Final Cut 10, and they, for whatever reason, chose not to do that. I think, and I haven't talked to the people that made the exact decision, but I think the problem was Apple was thinking like an engineering company, where an engineer says, okay, we're done with this product, now let's move on to the next version, and when the next version's available, the old product doesn't get used anymore. But in video, we're always going back to legacy products, and we're always going back to, to see if there's ways that we can take a movie that we did last year and mm -hmm. repurpose it. I mean, one only has to look at the multiple iterations of Gone with the Wind or Casablanca or, or The Wizard of Oz to realize that films have a life far beyond the initial production and post. And I think Apple lost sight of that. I, they know, I know, I know that they were stunned by the severity of the reaction totally what they were not expecting. They thought people would say, hey, this is an interesting idea, let's get excited. And they were just blindsided by the, the, the strength of the animosity. But now, put yourself in Apple's position. They've launched Final Cut 10. They can't go back mm -hmm. and say, all right, well, we screwed up. We're just going to launch it again. I mean, they, the, the, the horse is out of the barn. Yeah. They have to work with what they've got. Yeah. They can't go back and relaunch. So, of course, Apple is not going to stand and say, well, we made a mistake. That's nothing except class action lawsuit written all over it. <laughs> so Apple instead said what I thought was the wisest thing, which is we, we are committed to making this software the best that it can be. And just watch us. We may have, we, we, we have put an initial stake in the ground, but look at how many times we've upgraded it. And they, within a year, within a year after Final Cut 10 was released, they had gone through nine upgrades. Nine upgrades in a year. Now, look at Adobe. Let's just contrast this. Remember last year in May, Adobe announced that they were going to an all subscription pricing model. You could no longer buy software. Yes. You could only rent the software. And the world thought that it was ending. And people were tearing garments and rending their hair. And, and life was over as we knew it. And, and so what did Adobe say? Adobe said, well, we just want this because it's going to allow us to make faster upgrades. And what has happened since they went to the subscription? They've had four major upgrades in less than a year. 
they've they've they have recognized as apple did that the software world is changing and they need to make accommodations for it and we all hate change especially when our career is based in it when when i make my living with a piece of software and that software changes it's not larry saying oh larry you got to learn something new it's why did they screw my life and now it's over and i'm going to walk in front of large moving trucks and and <laughs> <laughs> but but the way that you judge this is you say, where are they now? What have they done? If you look, it has never been a better time than right now for video editing. Avid, a phenomenal program. Apple, a phenomenal program. Adobe, a phenomenal program. Every single one of these, these companies, Autodesk, phenomenal. If you don't have a company that starts with the letter A, you can't make video <laughs> editing software. Alphabet soup. But, but the... Never, never before in time have we had such incredibly powerful tools that are so incredibly easy to use that are, that are within the affordability of millions of people. And so now the question becomes not, is this product good or not? If, if you were to put an expert, people that really know video and editing, and you were to edit a show on Avid and Adobe and Final Cut, even Autodesk, which I know less well, but still would qualify that. And you say, watch this from a cuts-only point of view, from an image quality point of view, you would not be able to tell them apart. Mm -hmm. As you get into effects, each of these different companies has a different view of effects. Each of these different companies has a different view on color grading. There we could see some differences. But in terms of ingest, editing, trimming, storytelling, all of that identical, absolute top of the line highest possible quality yeah. so now you're starting to buy into the interface now here's a big question Jay you've spent a lot of time learning Final Cut 5 and Final Cut 6 and Final Cut 7 mm -hmm. you've invested the time to build your career and so you become one of the high priests of video editing because you understand this so well you understand all the problems behind it now put yourself in the shoes of a 20-year-old that's just grown up that hasn't spent any time looking at this. And he says, wait a minute, why do, I have to, why do I have to do it one way versus another way? Apple realized that the world is changing, and they decided to put on an entirely different interface. Mm -hmm. Adobe realized that they had a really great opportunity to leverage the audience that Apple built with Final Cut 7 mm -hmm. and deliver a new product, the CC release of Premiere, that builds on that market that Apple had established with Final Cut 7 as exactly. well as all the earlier versions of Premiere. Yeah. So now we're starting to make decisions not based upon which is the highest quality. We're making decisions based upon which interface do I respond to. And just Adobe sales have skyrocketed their double-digit growth last year to this year. But also in Final Cut 10, Apple has sold more seats of Final Cut 10 than they have ever sold of Final Cut 7. Interesting. So we are seeing that, that just as we predicted two years, two and a half years ago, Apple has expanded the market for video editing far beyond the traditional market into markets that nobody's ever seen before. Amazing. So this is this is a situation where whatever we pick is a winner, and now we just get to pick the one that we're most comfortable with. All of them are good. Premiere is good. Final Cut's good. This is not a, this is not a situation where you lose. I'm going to tell you my own experience. I was doing Final Cut Seven when it happened, uh, and immediately, you know, having confidence in Apple, I went and downloaded. Uh, it was three hundred dollars. I downloaded a, a couple of them, you know, for a couple of machines. Uh, and I couldn't use them. I had so much trouble using them. It was, not, it was for me. Maybe I'm just in a, uh, you know stuck in my ways. But I I couldn't make them do what Final Cut Seven was doing. So then I began to look around, look around, talk to people, read articles. Uh, who knows what? I read a, a number of articles you wrote at the time, uh, trying to see you know well what about Adobe? I had used Adobe way back when you know years before that. Um, but I moved to Final Cut because everybody said Final Cut was better. And now people were saying that, uh, a lot of people anyway, were saying that Adobe was better. Uh, so I moved back and I found, it's just as you say, Larry, that although the net effect of the movie was pretty much the same as, as Seven, the color was better. And I found that the, you know, the interface was real friendly and could do things that Final Cut 7 couldn't do. And I became wedded you know, to Adobe, which is what I am today. And, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you one thing, and I, I'd be interested in your thought about this. I have them both on my machine, but I haven't used Final Cut like, you know, recently. I, my main engine is the Adobe. When I go back to use Final Cut, I can't remember a thing. 
<laughs> all the shortcuts gone, all the techniques yeah. gone. So I think you have to focus on one and you get to be devoted to that one. You know, it's a brand loyalty thing and it probably lasts, you know, assuming uh, nothing comes in the way to disrupt you. Uh, you stay with it for years and years. As long as it's moving ahead, it becomes yours and you are married to it. No? I think that's true, and I think you also take it one more step further, which is that you become part of the in-group. We're the smart people that use this particular product, whether in your case it's Premier or in a case of other people it's Final Cut 10. We identify ourselves with the groups that we're associated with, and we define ourselves a lot with, with the other people that we hang out with that do the same tasks that we do. Mm -hmm. And marketers recognize that, and, and they try to build that, as you call it, brand loyalty. My job is to help you regardless of whether you're using Premiere, which I train in, or whether you're using Final Cut, which I train in, or working with one of the ancillary programs that works with either one, my job is to give you the skills so that when you open that package up, you say, hey, I know how this works. Larry showed me. I know how I can do this. This is easy because I, I learned it. At, at that point, you know, I get to step back and you get all the credit for doing all the work. <laughs> but my job is to support you so that you feel that you're not standing out there on a net in a high wind saying, am I going to fall off or am I going to stay on? I'm going to give you the support you need to stay on. Keep on. Make it beautiful. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing. You, you, usually people who do this sort of thing, they, they're in a little, a little uh, stovepipe affair, a silo. And they don't, they don't necessarily have people, you know, sitting alongside them unless maybe they're in a, in a shop where there's a lot of people doing the same thing. But I think yeah. it's really important to have somebody, some counselor you can call, something, some way to fill in the gaps of your self-knowledge. Self and if you don't do that, you're going to lose time and, and you'll never know exactly what you're missing. So you've got to have a third person. Uh, like, yeah. like Larry Jordan or, you know, somebody who will help you on that odd question that all of a sudden, you know, gives you the aha. <laughs> that, no, that's exactly true, is, is that we spend our lives working alone in dark rooms. And there's nobody to turn and ask a question to unless you're working with a really large production. But most of us are working solo. And all we have is what we know. And if all you can do is just work with what you know, you're never going to learn anything new and you're going to come up against roadblocks that you can't fix. That's where I come in. Yeah. What about those weekly Wednesday webinars? Uh, you mentioned them in passing, but uh, that sounds like a really uh, interesting experience. I mean, I must say, I'm not sure exactly how you conduct a webinar. Can you tell us what it's like, what the particip uh, participation no, it's, it's, is like? It's, uh, it's a, uh, think of it as a, a well, a fireside chat's probably too informal. But I'll pick a subject. Um, two weeks ago, we looked at... Um, media management in Final Cut 10. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did an in-depth look at Adobe Media Encoder or an in-depth look at Apple Compressor, because I try to do both Adobe and Apple products fairly equally. But we'll take a particular subject, a specific subject, third-party plugins, or color correction, or effects, or media management, or editing and trimming, but something that relates, and then really drill into it for about 45 minutes, and say, here's how you use the software, here's the differences between, look at this technique, look at that technique. And because I've got a live audience with me, and the live audience is able to, to uh, ask questions, then everybody benefits from everybody else's question, and I get to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the people trying yeah. to learn something new. Yeah. So the weekly webinar started two and a half years ago, and we do them most Wednesdays. I've got a big road trip coming up. I'm in Alaska on Saturday, and I'm in uh, London for a week and a half, so we're going to have the, the webinar stop for a couple of weeks. But when I get back to the office, we'll pick it back up, and we'll be looking at some new features in Premiere and some new features in Final Cut and new plugins. And this, What this does is this gives me a really great excuse to learn something new and then share it with the audience. And then we <laughs> post it to the YouTube we post it to uh, to my store so people can download it. So we try to make the information available a couple days after the webinar is over. Oh, that's great. And you still go, go around and give lectures too, huh? Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, we do seminars and we do uh, we do personal training, we do consulting, we do seminars, we do a live podcast audio only Thursday nights for an hour, which is talking with the latest uh, manufacturers and filmmakers about what's happening in the industry and how people are creating their films. I do a weekly newsletter, we do the webinars, and then I do in-depth training. Ah, it's public service. Uh, let me but let me go to the last thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and that sure. is this. Um, the future. You know, we, we've seen in only a few years, we've seen this go from a, a very, you know, very small base of people doing it 
uh, with a huge, huge steep learning curve to people who can actually learn how to do it online using sites uh, such as LarryJordan.biz um, and can get more powerful machines and better software, more intuitive interfaces and all that, and make movies. I mean, from nothing, an average person in a fairly short period of time, a little concentration, a little midnight oil can make movies. Where is this going to go? Um, you know, what, what features do you see as coming down the, the pike that will be disruptive and that will take it to the next, uh, the next chapter? Well, I'm not sure disruptive is the right word. I think that the, there is an inescapable march toward communicating with pictures, both still and video. I think we're seeing also that there is an inescapable march toward higher resolution. We're seeing also there's an inescapable march toward faster internet connections so people can get information downloaded faster their computers. So I think what we're going to see is anybody can create a movie. I mean, that part is true. But how do you get people to watch? That's a much harder question to answer. So not only do you need all the, the skill and craft of a filmmaker from the point of view of being able to know what buttons to push to record on a camera and set a light and edit the shot, but you need all the skill and craft of a filmmaker in telling a story, whether it's a, a simple instructional video or whether it's a feature film or a wedding video. Story becomes at the heart of why you're going to compel anybody else to watch it. All of a sudden, people are going to realize, hey, I've been creating movies for the last year and a half, and they've had five views on YouTube. What am I doing wrong? There's no story. We're going to see that the technology is going to change so radically that in five years, none of us are going to recognize what the technology is because it hasn't even been invented yet. The, the downside to this is the investments that we make now are going to retard our ability to adopt the new technology because we can't. We can't amortize the cost of high-end cameras fast enough. But basically, storage is going through a revolution. Cameras are going through a revolution. Codecs are going through a revolution. Software interfaces are going through a revolution. And the vast majority of the market will be people that have never shot video before and are suddenly picking up video editing software and trying to say, how do I tell a story? That's going to be driving the next high end of the market. Do you think there'll be software that will help you tell the story? that will help you identify the beginning, the middle, and the end, and um, you know, sort of counsel you through a story that more than five people will watch? I think that's probably a little bit too far out. What I think we're seeing now, then software exists already, to help us convert our video into something that we can see, like text blocks. And then just as you drag puzzle pieces around on a table, we drag these text blocks around. And rather than have to watch the video and decide where to set ins and outs, we read the transcript, drive the in and the out, and hit a go button. And the transcript is automatically edited into video. That technology exists today. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see much more sophisticated systems at helping us manage assets. Shooting ratios now, a one hour program is dealing with 80 hours of material or 150 hours of material. We're drowning in visual data. How do we manage it? Metadata and asset management and media management become, become massively important for anything except maybe a family video because there's just so much of it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see a greater emphasis on, on managing our media, a greater emphasis on finding the media that we want continued simplification of interfaces, improved hardware, but the real improvement for us has to be in storage, not in computers. Storage is everything. These are all some of the trends we'll be looking at over the next year. What about, uh, you know, a couple of things that come to mind on that, right? You know, <clears throat> the newspapers aren't selling as well. <clears throat> People are still interested in what happens, and, and I've seen some wonderful, wonderful documentaries on PBS and elsewhere that are just entrancing. I, I won't go into how many, or, but I'll say a lot of them are absolutely wonderful movies. And I'm thinking that uh, for this market you're talking about, for these guys who are just getting into video, sort of translating their lives into their product and video, they're making more documentary type movies. They're, they're making nonfiction movies, and nonfiction movies are going to be more popular um, simply because people want to learn. I mean, the, the grand audience wants to learn uh, even before the football game. Well, yeah, maybe not but, that. <laughs> but the problem, Jay, that we're seeing right now is that the audience may want to learn, but nobody wants to pay for it. 
Mm -hmm. The fastest way to lose money is to make a documentary. You'll spend all of your money in production, but how do you make it back? There's tens of thousands of documentaries that are created every year, and maybe one-tenth of one percent make enough money back to cover their production cost. The, the business model for making money on films is still way screwed up. It was, it was all toward theatrical, but so few films can be released theatrically, and they're so expensive to release and to market. How do we get the word out of really important documentaries that people need to see, and yet do it in such a fashion a filmmaker can make money with it? This is a, an issue we're wrestling with on a daily basis, and we don't have a solution for it yet. And the last and final question, it's a sort of personal to Think Tech Hawaii, is we, we're committed to uh, doing our thing on the Internet. We, we take our footage and we also broadcast it on community television and on, on cable. We have, we have spots on both places. If you look us up, you'll see. But, um, you know, I'm thinking that the mainstream in the future is going to be the Internet. It's going to be on either computers or uh, TV monitors, big TVs that are attached to computers. Uh, one Chromecast and otherwise, um, and and that is where you know the future of this this um, this this whole process is going to go. What do you think? I think that's an easy question to ask, but a hard one to answer. I think in terms of reach, reaching micro audiences, the internet is absolutely the best way to go. In terms of reaching a mass audience, the the, uh, the internet may be a way to go. Think of a video going viral on YouTube, but the amount of money that you make. And it all comes back to, can I afford to live as a filmmaker? If you've got funding from a, another source that's paying for your production costs, the Internet is absolutely the best option. But it's not the option that's going to make you a ton of money. It's going to make you about $100 per 100,000 views on YouTube, which means that if I needed to make up $40,000 in production costs, I've got to have something like 40 or 50 million views on YouTube to be able to recover that. Not a lot of films hit that level of, of viewership. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it all comes back to how am I going to earn a living? If you're a hobbyist, you don't care because you're making your money somewhere else. But if you're a professional, which is how we open this whole discussion, you got to pay the rent. And until we figure out where the money is coming from and who pays the money, the money right now is in broadcast. First, second is cable. Third, the Internet. But the Internet still is a visibility mechanism. It's not a revenue-generating mechanism. Not in general. Not for most people. Not under most situations. For some, yes. But not for the majority. Okay, we've got to, still, we've got to watch that. And we'll watch your site for you know, advice and consultation on that one, too, Larry. Uh, Thank Larry you. Jordan, video software educator par excellence. We've been visiting with him today in Think Tech Talks. Thank you so much, Larry. It's been an honor to talk with you. I really appreciate the, the help, the advice, and the education. Uh, Jay, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure joining you today. As they say, aloha. <laughs>